Hello, everyone, and happy holidays. I am so excited to be coming to you with the last edition of Come As You Are for the Year. And it's one that's very special and near and dear to me because this is the season where we typically talk about family. So I thought in honor of that, I would introduce you to some of mine. I don't know how many of you know that I grew up and didn't have the easiest childhood, but something that I'm quite proud of is that I am the oldest of five. And so I'm here with number four today, Christina. How are you, Chris? Doing well, Les. It's good to see you. Good to see you, too. Um, We're going to talk a little bit about, we're going to get squishy if you've seen Anything we've done over the past month or so, you've seen some of IE's values, and one of our values is that we're squishy, and that for us means we're going to be vulnerable. We're going to talk about things that um, might not be easy to talk about, but I think these are conversations that are necessary. So something that Christine and I talked about before we filmed this was, you know, what it was like growing up and the pressures to have a holiday celebration that felt normal or typical. Um, and there's a lot of grief around this time for you and I. So I'm just going to give you the floor, Chris, and like talk about whatever you want to talk about, some of our experiences or what you think about during this season. Yeah, um, I want to say, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, we had um, an event, whether it be death or otherwise, that caused some pretty serious grief around most of our holiday, like most of like holiday events uh like we we had people passing or we got like really bad news around holidays and so I know for me growing up uh when everyone's like oh my gosh it's Christmas or oh my gosh Thanksgiving I was just like oh that was the time that um you know this was the time of year that we we found out you know Papa had cancer um and I was I was like 10 so that's about the age that like if we're looking into neurodevelopment that like 10 year olds kind of start to understand the like permanency of death, but like not all 10 year olds. Um, so I was just like, what is cancer? What is, um, what does this mean? Because he's invincible. Like, I don't know if you've, you've, we all have that family member in our life that life can't go on without them because they are, they are at the center of like our stability. Um, and outside, uh, as you mentioned, the not great times of our childhood, um, Pop and Grandma's house was stability. It was safe. It was nurturing and loving, and and our one of our few places for um, for us to feel normal. You know that 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 spot in which we got other kids when they're like yeah I love going to grandma and grandpa we're like yeah we me too like it's great you know we can sleep in and like feel safe sleeping and have some routine and um and so it it was I think it for me um and I'm not sure about everyone else because that's another thing is just because you grow up in the same household with uh doesn't mean that you're gonna have the same experiences of grief so I know that like you handle things different th- differently than me and 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 you know I can't I can't speak for the rest of our siblings either because we all had very different experiences even under the same household and I think that's a lot of times something that doesn't get talked on a lot cuz everybody kind of gets yeah. grouped in together it's like your family must feel this about a situation and that's not always the case um but it was for me like the end of an era of that was that was the place of safety that was the place of um a a chance to breathe emotionally and physically and um with him passing away it it was a a moment of what does this mean now and also following um it was at papa's funeral that that dad was escorted by officers to a new a new duty station as well um so it was just like a whole season of 
what does this mean? Um, what what is yeah. going to come from this? Um, this is not to disparage the military, but uh, there are many, many people who come home from the military who don't know how to process what they've seen and experienced. And that results in often the families getting that emotional backlash um, because you can't, you can't talk about it in public. Yeah. You can't, you can't explore it with other people. Um, so this is, this is our family. This is our family thing that we have to keep in here. Uh, you, you don't talk about it to people. Um, and so I know for me with the news of him going to another duty station, it was, what is this going to mean now? Um, what, what if things get worse? Um, yeah. And so, Can I stop you for a second? Yeah. Because I feel like you've not not to like stop the train of thought you're on because I think you're you're going in the right direction. But there's so many important things that you've just talked on that I want to make sure to highlight for folks because um, you're right. You and I, even though all of those things happened to both of us like concurrently, we didn't have the same experiences with them. Not that they weren't bad for me; they were. But I was 16, so I was in a different state of processing a different state of being I was navigating high school and a boyfriend at the time too and you weren't um but Papa was still invincible to me too and so mm -hmm. that hit in a different way I remember um hating turning 17 because it was the first year I'd be around without him and uh yeah I think a lot of people know I'm a military brat so it's important to call that out there's there's two very important things I want to call out because we've just we've gone through um, and are still going through a pandemic together. And so during the holiday season, there are people sitting at our table or that should be sitting at our table that aren't. And so that absence is very much felt. I know that you and I feel it. And then there's an absence felt because people are serving. People are gone. Yeah. Um, and it's it doesn't always have that same warmth, that same feel for everybody. And during a season where everybody's like, oh, you know, this is supposed to be exciting and loving and happy. Um, sometimes we don't always feel that joy. And sometimes I remember uh, because I've been through a divorce and I remember the first Christmas after I got a divorce and it was the worst Christmas of my life. I was alone. Everybody was everywhere else. Um, it was me and my cat <laughs> who's still around. And I remember walking into grocery stores or department stores and hearing Christmas music or holiday music and going, I don't want to hear any of this. I don't want to be around any of this. I want to be around people. Um, and I really could have just used a lifeline in that moment. Just somebody saying, hey, you know, like, it's OK to be bummed right now. Um, yeah in a time when everybody's like filled with joy. So I just, I want to call out those things because I think you hit on some like really key moments that some people might be going through right now. And I think it's important to talk about, it's okay to be happy right now too. Like yeah. it's, it's totally okay to be experiencing some joy during the holidays, but it's also okay to know that not everybody's experiencing it too. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate you calling out those points because it is, it is one of those things where, I know for I know for me, my experience of the household was crying in public is a no no, and you don't show that you're upset. That's not okay, and it's not how we do things. Um, it took me until I was twenty four or twenty five that I could cry in front of friends and not have a panic attack because I thought I was doing something wrong. Um, and I think that one thing that happens with the positive psychology that goes wrong is the oh just be happy just be happy with what you got well sure you you may you may be going through a divorce but you still have your cat Alyssa and and it's it's Christmas so you should just be happy because you're alive and you're healthy and you have your cat and so you're fine you're fine you know and that's what we tell children to you, you know they fall and scrape their knee you're fine no they're feeling pain like they're not okay right they will be okay but like being able to sit and pause with someone in the moment and allow them to go, hey, right now, actually things suck. And just because you're having a bad emotion doesn't mean you're a bad person or that you've done anything wrong to deserve it. Um, mm. When I worked um, on the National Suicide Hotline, I 
I would say probably seven out of 10 calls were people calling and asking me, is this normal? Do people feel this way? Mm. Like I went through this really, really difficult experience. And all I feel is this, is this permanent? Is there any way out of this? Um, and it was just going, well, that's just part of the human experience, but you know, not, not as blunt as that, but, um, going, well, you know, you, you just lost your job. You're, you know, somebody you love is sick your dog died, whatever it may be. And that feeling of grief that almost is taboo to talk about of, okay, well, you know, yes, the the first month people are like, oh my gosh, are you okay? I'm so, so sorry. Like, are you right? Maybe, maybe up to the first six months where people are checking in on you and then it kind of tapers off, but you're still sad. You're still, yeah. you know, maybe most days you're trucking along, like things are grand. And then you see something that reminds you of that grief that that just triggers it and pulls it back and that's the the um I'm gonna pronounce this wrong because my brain is mush the the Tolkien model (laughs) of of uh grief where it says that like our lives grow around grief and so it's not just that the grief gets smaller and some of us some of us have had more grief moments than others I have fully adult friends that have never lost a loved one and I'm just looking at them like like, are you vampires? Because they don't understand how this hurts. Because for us, we want. <laughs> I specifically remember in high school, one of my teachers calling me out and accusing me of making up deaths in the family to get out of things and going the next day and just dropping the dozen obituaries on this teacher's yeah. desk and them being at a loss for words because they didn't think it was real. They, they, they couldn't process someone losing. Cause I think we lost what 12, fa- 12 family members or close friends in a matter of in like, like five, five years. years. Yeah. And, and the teacher was just like, this couldn't, this can't be happening because you just lost someone like six months ago. I'm like, yeah, I know. Like, I also uh-huh. don't want this to be happening, but I'm glad, <laughs> I'm glad we're on the same page there. But I, I remember it coming across almost as a I don't have time to keep catching you up so if you could keep people from dying over over like just keep people from dying in your family that'd be really helpful for me as a, as a teacher and while I empathize with them because teachers have very very hard jobs uh being a teacher's aide for a short short period uh in in university made me even more appreciate like the hard work that goes into it but at the time it was like I'm sitting here trying to grieve I'm not supposed to be crying. And anytime I did break out and break down and cry in school, like I ran to hide in the, hide in the bathroom or yeah. um, I just felt like a terrible person. I felt like I was doing it wrong. I was having feelings wrong because crying wasn't allowed. We don't cry in our household because strong people don't cry. Like it's just, it's just not an emotion that's allowed. Um, and I think that that's, there are other people that have similar upbringings where certain emotions weren't allowed or certain things weren't allowed to be expressed but it's also I think important to note that sometimes we can self-impose those of of what we're allowed to do as a strong woman in business or as um I'm not a man but like as a man are you I was allowed gonna to say <laughs> have you had you not brought it up I would we have a brother who's who's number three right in the middle um and while we weren't allowed to cry he definitely was not allowed to cry um there were yeah, oh, absolutely. There were even more gendered uh, parameters put on Josh that you and I didn't experience. So we can process emotions now because looking like we do in society, acting like we do in society, being socialized like we have in society, it's more acceptable for us and not for him. So I, I do want to call that out because as you are processing grief, whether you present as more mask or femme, does have an impact and does make a difference. Um, and I'm so appreciative for you calling that out because I think, especially during this time, there's a lot going on, right? Like there's school, there's work, there's holidays, there's parties, there's social circles, there's everybody's closing out their year, there's business, there's so many things going on. And I think everybody's just like, put all of the stuff you have aside and just focus on doing all of these things. And it's okay to not, it's okay to not, I think the other thing I want to make sure that we talk about too, because this is something that we all kind of did, all five of us kind of did this in our own way. We all kind of created our ho- our own holiday traditions, which was super taboo at the time. I remember um, 
not going home for Thanksgiving or Christmas or any of the holidays once I got to college. Because as as we mentioned, yeah, as we mentioned, we didn't have a great childhood. And so going home had its own. <laughs> yeah, we didn't want to do it. Um, and I know you have a family now. You live in the UK with your with your husband and daughter. And I have a family now, too. And so I would love to hear how you started to create some holiday traditions or experiences for yourself. And I can talk to some of mine, too. Um, so fun fun background i was supposed to move uh to the uk on 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 my visa in like march of 2020 and some stuff happened globally that i think most people are aware of we don't need to go for any of that but i ended up not getting here until december 16th so there was a little bit of a like a, a lag of, there was a lag um there was also a child born in uncertainty yep. i'm just like um so our our tradition that we started for our family is um so we used to when when everybody did come home decorate the christmas tree for thanksgiving at our house in the states thanksgiving isn't a holiday in the uk so that'd be like i still i still sometimes celebrate with friends where i like call people around and make a big meal and say hey i love you and i'm thankful for you but not the same vibes because not everybody else is doing it also like you have to take days off to like really get it done around the same time um but uh my husband Connell his family didn't start decorating for Christmas until Christmas Eve which I was just like what like no (laughs) decorations until Christmas Eve and I was just like all right well I don't want to do that and also we don't want to like force force bring on our childhood of traditions so the day that I landed in the UK was the 16th of December so that was our that is that is our family celebration day of when we got to be oh. together. Um, after sixteen months apart, uh, we or not sixteen months, sixteen weeks apart. Hmm, big difference. Sixteen weeks apart. Yeah. Um, we got reunited on the sixteenth, and so I don't I don't know of a better day to decorate and and start to to celebrate the holiday season than the sixteenth. Um, as just a little. A little reminder of of the positive things in life. Um, it is it is important to recognize that traditions that that you may see about, um, whether it be like culturally or what you've seen like other families do, that it doesn't have to apply to you, and it also doesn't have to happen on the same day. Um, I was talking to a friend uh, who has been having a difficult time with Thanksgiving and was saying that they don't really have any traditions and they, they want to start traditions, but they're single and they're, you know, really confused. I'm like, well, just do what you want. Like, um, my husband and I, mostly me, just cause I wanted ice cream, decided that in 2021, our family tradition for Halloween would be to bake banana splits just because I want a specific day that I get ice cream every year. Um, I feel like he was going to get into it as well once he gets older. Uh, and she also very much does like bananas and ice cream. So um, it was just an impromptu, we're not going to take her trick-or-treating in the middle of COVID. So what's something that we can do for our family to make it fun? And that's the thing is your your family traditions don't have to make sense to anyone else. And you don't ha- even have to do it with family. You can pull around friends. You can You can call your best friend who is your chosen family and say, I want to do something special with you. Let's make this our friend day. I think that's beautiful. And I think it's so important to honor what you want to. I think so often, especially socialized as femmes in society, so often we think it's important to just do what everyone else wants for us. Um, And I think it's important to ask around this holiday season, what do I want? What do I want to get out of this? Um, Make that part of your wish list this year, right? Uh, I know when I was creating my own traditions, Kevin and I have started landing on traveling um, and not always traveling to family. Sometimes we travel and visit friends on holidays. And I think it's a beautiful representation of spending time with people and learning and growing with others. What, what advice would you give someone this time that's really struggling with how to grapple with everything that's happening? I mean, we've already touched on a lot of things, but there's been a global pandemic. There's been 
um, just economic issues, social unrest. Well, what advice would you give someone that's navigating all of this and still trying to make space for themselves during the holidays? I would say pause. Um, I know that's very hard to do. It's, it's an extremely difficult thing to do. Um, if you are waking up in the morning and dreading getting out of bed, um, struggling to do hygiene, struggling to meal plan, struggling to eat meals, um, clearly your body's telling you that you're overwhelmed. Um, so call and use one of your days off that you you have paydays off. Maybe, well, most people, most people have paydays off. Uh, you know, I don't know what everyone's situation are and, and whether or not they have them, but use one of your paid days off um, and just take a second to breathe. Don't answer emails, shut off your phone um, and ask yourself what what's your priority, right? What what is What is something that brings you joy? And just check in with yourself. Um, uh, analogy that I used a lot when I was working at the crisis center was, you know, Sports teams is, is something that a lot of people follow. And I ask people, I'm like, when you first started following sports, did you just get to know the roster when you first started liking the team and then like didn't keep up with it, didn't check the roster, didn't check the stats, didn't check how the gameplay was going, you just like checked it once and then you're like, I'm a fan, good to go. No, most most hardcore fans, they are regularly checking the roster. They're checking and seeing the health of the player. They're checking. So they spend a lot of time reflecting and checking in on something that they think is important but they don't spend that time on themselves. They don't take that time to go, how am I feeling? How have I changed? Um, how have my relationships changed? How has my job changed me? Um, and taking that time to go, hey, I'm something and I'm someone that is important and I deserve to be checked in with as well um, because we can't really create a map on where we want to go until we know where we're at. Um and so just taking that time to reflect, however that looks like for you, whether it be, um, you know, just whether whether people enjoy meditation or yoga, or if that's not their jam, whether it just be going, hey, my body feels weird today. I feel extra angry. Why am I angry? Why am I so angry? <laughs> I've been talking to a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of moms that I've been talking to, where we've been talking about how angry we feel and just because like we're touched out and overwhelmed and have so much on our plate. Um, and it's like, well, why do we feel so angry? First and foremost, it's probably because we're not getting enough sleep. Um, and I'm Fair. the first person to tell you that um, I think over the past month, I've been averaging like four hours of sleep a night. This is like three layers of concealer right now. Um, so I'm not going to harp on people about the the importance of sleep because while, while I wish I could get it, it has not been happening. Um, but it is recognizing what our body needs. Um, we are conditioned from a young age. I brought up, you know, that, you know, little kids are told they're okay when they're hurting. We're conditioned from a young age to say that, you know, you don't need a bathroom break at school. You don't need to go get water. You don't actually, you aren't actually feeling sick. Your head actually isn't hurting because we have to be in class and we have to, to be in class so that the public schools get paid for us being in class. And that was, that, that system is straight out of the industrial revolution to even even down to the bells to train people to be better factory workers. Um, and mm. so how our upbringing has been shaped isn't necessarily based on how we as humans and we as like physical beings need to process things. Um, and so just even allowing yourself to, even without like a set, a set dot guideline to get up from your desk and go to the bathroom or go make yourself a cup of tea or coffee or get a drink or just go for a stroll around the building if your head is just melted and you can't think straight. Allowing yourself to take those needed breaks and allowing yourself that autonomy and going, body, I'm listening to you. Um, you've had to pee for the past four hours, but you know I've had meeting after meeting after meeting saying, hey, can you excuse me one moment or being five minutes late and saying, apologies, another meeting ran on, but allowing your body to do what it needs to do. Uh, I'm sure health, I've talked to health professionals and they say it's not good to hold hold stuff in, whether it be uh, having to pee or emotions, depending on what doctor you um, <laughs> No form of constipation is great. No form of constipation is good for you. Um, but it, 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 is, it is very freeing to go, okay, wait a second. I, I, can, I can allow myself to go to the bathroom. I don't need a bell to tell me I'm allowed to go or 
uh, an, an, a set organizational date that allows me to use the restroom, which I know it's not just you and I. I've talked to friends that are like, oh, I haven't a chance to go to the bathroom all day because work was mental. And I'm like, huh, but that was me. Like, I'm not judging. That was me a couple of years ago. And I know that that was you as well, based on what we've talked about as in order to be I good, mean, we had to be productive. <laughs> And in order yep. to be productive, we were overachievers in work because we had to be overachievers at home. And exactly. a lot of people don't see that perfe- how perfectionism forms and how it's how so much of it is anxiety based. Oh my goodness, we we could do a whole. <laughs> we'll have to bring you back, and and we'll have to do a whole thing on perfectionism because that's a whole different layer that we can explore. But um, what I'm hearing is a few things, and and just so you know, I I recently met with a friend who told me it's okay to put eat lunch or go to the bathroom on my to-do list. Um, And I actively advise that please, please do that for yourself. But what I'm hearing is listen to yourself and it's okay to feel any way you want to feel. Like if you feel weird at this time of year, like it's probably pretty justifiable. Yeah. uh, Given everything that's going on. Um, Chris, I, I'm so grateful that we had a chance to do this today. It's we rarely get to see each other now that we're a few time zones away. Um, and there's a pond in between, as I think they call it. But we'll have to <laughs> we're definitely gonna have to change that as time goes on. And um I don't think it will come as a surprise to anybody that's listening that you like working with people and helping people. And um I would love the chance for you to talk about where people can find um, the work that your company does and if they need support or resources at this time. Yeah, so I actually am uh, the project manager for traumatic bereavement in Northern Ireland. So uh, that's, that's the, my little, my little hole in the UK that I'm currently in. Um, I work for cruise bereavement support um, and you can find a lot of information about how to care for yourself and also how to care for others who are su- who are facing bereavements, whether that it just recently happened or maybe it happened a couple of years ago, you didn't have a chance to process it and it's all hitting you now. Um, there's loads of resources. If you go to our website at www.cruse.org.uk, um, there's loads of resources on how to support yourself and others in the holiday, uh, how to write holiday cards even. Like that's something that people don't think about. But there's resources on our LinkedIn and our website about how do you write cards to a loved one who's just lost someone? Do you include their name? Do you mention them? Um, and so just just so you know, it you know, it depends on on that person, but absolutely like keep, you know, that person is alive. And as as long as you, you know, talk to the person and they're happy to like keep bringing that up, is you know. Talk about that person. Talk about the person that they lost. Um, Part of that grief is being able to share that person's life and the meaning of that life with other people. Um, And especially through COVID and how funerals were restricted, that part of grieving was so greatly disrupted um, where those cultural traditions of that post-funeral care, like in the States, we had potlucks always have to have funeral potatoes. I was trying to explain that to people here and they're like, what are funeral potatoes? I'm like, they're just delicious. <laughs> it's, it's just a recipe that you have at funerals. Um, they were very confused because I made it for Thanksgiving. I'm like, they're funeral potatoes. And they're like, did someone die? And I'm like, no, like it's the, the it's cultural. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, but like not being able to have those potlucks in the States after a funeral or here, not being able to have a wake in the house and have, have your loved one stop by and have a cup of tea and, and share of share about the loved one that can cause so much confusion with your grieving on what what you're feeling because you didn't get that that expected step on being able to process the loss of that loved one um and we do our all of our emotions pro, all of our emotions happen within the framework of our culture so what happens everybody has the same emotions but based on what our culture seems as deems as not necessarily good or bad or de- deems yeah, as acceptable or yeah, it, it can change. And so it is important to support ourselves and our loved ones within understanding their culture. And so the grief that you may be experiencing this holiday season, um, if, if, you don't have friends from the same culture as you try to reach out. I know that um, I was talking to someone from Diversity Matters here in the UK 
who said that there's a Facebook Live going on every Tuesday to help individuals who are Jamaican mm -hmm. um, process not being able to uh, have their ninth night ceremony uh, as, as part of their grieving culture um, and, and what that means. Because normally they go to the elders, but unfortunately all their elders had passed away during COVID. So it, it is one of those things on the going back to that's the importance of taking that break as far as what do you need because your grief journey is very specific to you and you're not doing it wrong just because you're not doing it the same way your family member is or another loved one has been um so just just those just those I know those are many key points but just those no key points. they are but um that last thing you said I thought was was beautiful um nothing you're doing about it is wrong um I think that's key and I I wish that we would have heard that growing up but I'm really grateful that uh you've become the person that you are that we've all been able to grow and change and learn and adapt and find our own way and that we can tell ourselves that now and that you can tell your your daughter that now um so for those of you listening thank you so much for tuning in for being squishy with us um uh, <laughs> I love being squishy with my family and I love my siblings dearly. It was a joy spending time with you this morning, Christina. Well, this morning for me, <laughs> the afternoon for you, but um, please give my love to Connell and Kiva and happy holidays. Happy holidays.